Alright. No, tell us. Huh? What do the stars represent? Stars on the patch? You put stars on this patch. It's a southern cross. It's in the sky. You okay. know, up in the sky, southern cross. And the only place you can see it is down the South Pacific. So that's why they that's why they put it on this patch. The first division patch is the same it has the same thing on it, you know. Only it has a one with Guadalcanal on it. This was written by our second in command. Griffin. Yeah, it's Adam Griffith. And he, he was our CO on New Georgia. It's some water if you need okay. it. Okay. Get cough drops. <laughs> well, when you, uh, <clears throat> Amy's going to start in a minute, but when you went down to the uh, New York State Military Museum and they did the interview with you, it's going to basically be the same type of setup. Yeah. Wasn't it? And, uh, Was uh, it a. Uh, I know the guys who do the interviews. Of course, I can't think of his name right now. Well, it's on that sheet. It's on that. Uh, it's on the tape, yeah. Mike, or Mike Rousser. Mike Rousser. Or his friend Bob. Anyway, we're going to cut this part out of the tape because it's going to go down there. So they won't know that. I don't know the name. Now, you can see how we're here at eight, so maybe you have to speak up a little bit. Okay. Like when I was doing with Mr. Leone. Okay. Speak up. Don't be shy. All right. And if you can't hear you, he's going to ask you again. Okay. When you get my age, you go through a few things like that. Hey, Amy, he told you, Amy told you what tomorrow is, didn't she? It's his birthday. Oh, tomorrow. What's what's the date in history? Tomorrow's December seventh. Oh, Pearl Harbor. Oh. Well, nineteenth birthday. They blow in Pearl Harbor. So why? Okay, go ahead. It's already recording. Oh, all right. I'm ready. <laughs> um, ready. Wait for you. My name is Amy Baumler, and I'm interviewing Mr. Robert Edison at Hudson Falls High School, December sixth. 2005. It's quarter three. Quarter of three. <laughs> and we're ready to start. Um, of course, my first question is going to be where were you on December 7th, 1941? I was home celebrating my birthday with, with a few of my friends. It was a Sunday. And uh, we were, my youngest sister had gone to the movies. And when she came back, she said they stopped the movie and said they bombed Pearl Harbor. So that's when I heard about it. So we turned on the radio, no television in those days. Turn on the radio and that's about all you could hear. Was, was, was the news. Yeah, that's, that's when news really got started. They didn't have week daily news uh, up until World War II. And from then on, that's when they started having these daily news classes. So that's where I was. Um, how did you become a part of Edson's Raiders? Well, uh, well let's go back. You know, I, uh, a month after the war started, I joined the Marine Corps, January 7th, 1942, and was sent down to Paris Island for boot camp. And prior to the war, boot camp had been 13 weeks, but turned, they had to get a, a, a division. They had parts of a division. So they had to get a division ready quickly, so they cut boot camp to six weeks. And so you were supposed to spend two weeks of close order drill, three weeks on the rifle range, and then a week of extended order drill. Well, when it come close to time for us to fire the rifle range, there wasn't any, time, any room down there because we were coming in 500 a day. So they just, after my close order drill, they gave us the week of extended order drill and put 500 of us on a train and shipped us up to Quantico fire the rifle range. Now, it's a little cooler up in Quantico than it is down Paris Island, South Carolina, and we were up there in January and in December, January and February, and it was pretty cool. In fact, I think it's the only time in the history of the Marine Corps on record day they called it off because the targets were flying out of the racks with the wind and stuff. It was windy and cold, but anyway. And then when I just about ready to finish uh, boot camp, they were 
filling up and forming this Raider Battalion. It had been what was called what had been the first battalion of the Fifth Regiment of the Marine Corps, but they had taken it out and was making a special uh, battalion out of it. And at this time is when they, when I was finishing boot camp, it was just about the time they made the name official of First Marine Raider Battalion. And so they were looking for a bunch of people to fill it up. And so they came out, we, they brought us in to their barracks and interviewed us. And then when we finished boot camp, then they just marched, my, my graduation boot camp was marching from the rifle range into the barracks and main base of Quantico to be part of the, the First Marine Raider Battalion. So that's how I got in. And that was in, uh, oh, about the 20th of February, 1942. I was reading in the book by Alexander that um, when you were sh shipped off to Samoa, you didn't know at first where you were going when you went on the train. Um, how, how did it feel to like not know where you were going well, on the train? Well, we knew we were going to the West Coast because <clears throat> I was in what was called the rear echelon. In April, most of the battalion well, let's back up. When I went into battalion, I was in 81 millimeter mortars. Well, then they said, well, they're too big for the kind of operation we're going to be. So they did away with them. And uh, because, you know, the base plate weighs about, I don't know, 80 pounds. And we just wouldn't, they, they figured we'd probably go into jungles and swamps and stuff. And you just couldn't carry something like that through. So they did away with those. And, uh, and our battalion as it was an oversized battalion. Most battalions have three rifle companies, a, more, a, a weapons company, and a headquarters company, which is about 750 men. But we had a fourth a rifle company, so we had close to 900 men. And in April, the, uh, most of the battalion, all the battalion except D Company, which hadn't fully formed yet, that was a rifle company, and the, the mortars they had done away with, we stayed, behind. we stayed behind in what they call the rear echelon. And they, they took off. They didn't know where they were going, really, when they got on the train until they got down south and turned west. And they said, uh-oh, we're going to the west coast. So, uh, and what they did, then they shipped out of San Diego and went to Samoa. And they were in Samoa for two months, our train. And we were back, rear echelon, then went to rear echelon and uh, dock dog company, D company, got fully developed. Then we left in June and did the same thing, five, five days across country, shipped out of San Diego, went to Samoa, and we had other troops with us, so we dropped them off at British Samoa, which is APIA, APIA, and then we went back to Pango Pango, where we got our rest of our troops and picked them up and went to New Caledonia. So that's we were uh, on the ocean 30 days. Um, what was it like? What was your training like? Your what training? Was, what was your training like? Uh, uh, you talking about boot camp or in the, in the Raider Battalion? Um, Raider Battalion training. Yeah, see, because boot camp to me was not much because I found that playing high school football in Ohio was tougher than boot camp was. And uh, so, uh, and then uh, when we got into Raider Battalion, then we really got in, into the force. Well, we would go out on a Saturday morning, we'd go on a 22-mile full pack force march, you know, in the morning, you know. <laughs> and then he'd give us liberty in the afternoon. But, uh, but it, it, uh, it was weird. Really, but it, it wasn't something, as I say, my, my high school football prepared me for, for being all this rough. And, and, that, it, and Edson was known for getting people in, in good physical condition and, uh, and he was the type of guy that you would go any you would he, you would follow him any place because what he would do when we were on these force marches he would stop he'd watch our way go by and then he'd get on his walkie talkie and they'd hold up and hit double time up start off and when we came in just a lot of barracks he would stand there and watch every man go by and give him compliments to us you know good job good job that's the type of leader he was, and you just, you know, and, and, and everybody practically worshipped him. He was, he was quite a leader. Um, you said you were 30 days out to sea. Were you on what was called an Abel Peter dog? A what? An Abel Peter dog ship? 
an APD? Oh, not go no. APDs were auxiliary patrol destroyers. Okay. And uh, what they were were World War One destroyers, four stacks. And what they had done, they had taken the, the old engines out and put diesels in. And that made room for 150 troops. So they assigned those ships to us to travel on. But going when overseas, we went overseas on a regular transport. And the APDs got caught up to us on New Caledonia. But there were only four of them at, the, at that point. So when we left New Caledonia, there were only four of them, so they couldn't take the whole battalion. And I was on guard duty up on a ridge. And this one, we'd been practicing, going ashore and going back and forth. And uh, all of a sudden, I look up and there they went. I said, gee, here I am, left behind again. But they just didn't have room. And so they waylaid a, a New Zealand, it had been kind of a cruise liner, you know. It had, uh, but they had converted it, and they called it a cruiser. It had a couple of five-inch guns on it. And, uh, and I guess it blew a couple of Jap subs out of the water because the Japs just thought it was a, one of these cruisers, and they thought they'd surface it. <laughs> but anyway, it had brought a load of muffin, mutton, mutton up to New Caledonia from New Zealand. And uh, so <laughs> uh, they, they went down and asked the guy, and... Uh, the Manawai, that was, his, that was the name of the ship. I got it. Yeah, the Manawai, that was the name of the ship. And they went, well, I'll go take you up, so did he. Uh, uh, in the meantime, the rest of them had all congregated up, up near the Fijis and to pull maneuvers prior to going into Tulagi and Guadalcanal. And uh, so he took us up there, and then we went aboard another transport, which was already filled up, so we had to sleep up on deck. And uh, he wouldn't have gone the whole way, but no, they said, no, no, you're going back now. So, so but anyway, that's the way we, that's those APDs, Auxiliary Patrol Destroyers. That's what, but we didn't go to seize them, but we moved, used them in our, when we left New Caledonia, and we moved, used them to go from Tulagi to Guadalcanal, down to Tazamboco, and around like that. Um, could you tell me about Tulagi? Tulagi? Well... Now, as I don't know if you've read about, but Tulagi was where the governor of the British Solomon Islands resided. See, they were British Solomon under British control. And so the governor lived on this little island, about a half mile wide, about three miles long, and they had, oh, they had parade ground, polo field, uh, you know, big nice houses and everything. And uh, of course, the Japanese had taken over and the British government had left there. And uh, so that's what, and uh, when we went in, they didn't even know we were coming because they'd been shelling them and bombing them for a couple of days. And then early in the morning, they bombed and shelled them again, and we went ashore. Now, as, you know, as this says, we were the first offensive ground troops to engage the Japanese. Because we went into Tulagi at 8 o'clock in the morning, and the rest of the division went into Guadalcanal at 9 o'clock. So we were the first. And so when we went ashore, and we were halfway down the island before they even knew we were there. And so we, 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 and it's a good thing they didn't know we were coming because it, the beach we went in on was coral, and our landing craft couldn't even get to the beaches because of the coral. And it, you'd be, then you had to get out, and about 100 yards we had to wade in. And sometimes it'd be at our knee deep, sometimes it'd be up to here, depending on where the coral was. And if the, those landing craft had gone, it had just, they were just made out of wood, the landing craft, and it would have just riddled them, you know, with that coral. So fortunately, there was not a defended beach there, and so we got a, all got ashore, and uh, above where they, uh, the, the, their residents were, and then moved down the, the island before, uh, before they knew we were here, there. And so, and as a result, they were in their caves. They, they had a lot of caves on them. They, they went into their caves, and uh, you come across some of the places where they had lived, and they still the breakfast was still warm on the, on, the, on the table, and they'd just taken off. Some of them weren't even dressed, and, and we didn't know it. We bypassed a lot of them, and then they came out at night. And that's when they, so that and it, uh, the first day we couldn't even use our mortars. The first day we had them in such a small pocket. We thought. We couldn't use mortars because they'd probably injure some of our own people. 
So that was the little island, Tulagi. That was across Sea Lark Channel, right in the cove of Florida Island. There was a good harbor there, and it was a Jap sub uh, base. It, it, made, it made a Japanese submarine, uh, submarine base out of it there. And it, was, it was a nice, uh, deep uh, harbor. So the Japanese came out at night, like the way that it happened? Oh, yeah. And they, they liked to fight at night, see? Psychological thing, because they thought, oh, well, gee, they, they, they could see, but it didn't take us long to find out. They couldn't see any better at night than we could. And so after that, after that first night, and then later on the Guadalcanal and up in New Georgia, if we were pushing them, we would withdraw a little bit at night, and they'd come looking for us, and a lot of times they couldn't find us, you know, because they couldn't see. They, we, they, uh, but it was psychological, you know. Now, you've got to remember now, these Japanese had never suffered defeat any place. You know, they'd been in Korea, they'd been in all the way down the southeastern mainland peninsula, the Philippines, Guam, Lake. They never, never, never beaten. And so they just thought they were invincible, but they weren't. Um, after Tulagi, you went to Guadalcanal. Can you tell me a little Julie bit about Turney, that? you have a phone call. Yeah, Julie well, Turney, after we took Tulagi, we were there until <laughs> close to the end of the month. We, uh, and uh, now prior to going over to Guadalcanal, remember that one picture I showed you of what they left behind at Teneru? Mm -hmm. Well, Teneru, well, in Guadalcanal, all we had was a perimeter defense, a small area around Henderson Airfield. I don't know if you can see it on there. It was just a small area, perimeter defense around the airfield. And that's all we had at Guadalcanal. And as you're looking at that, to the right, I don't know if the Teneru is on there or not, but uh, anyway, the Japs, they could land any time they wanted to. And they did. They landed troops, and with a thousand men, they tried to take the airstrip back again. Well, the Marines sucked them into a trap and annihilated them, all but about 20 or 30 of them. And uh, now, let's back up a little bit and go back to Tulagi. Two days after we landed, August 9th, there was a big sea battle around the Savile. I don't know if you see Savile, it's up in there. See, see those uh, spa, uh, things down there with one, number one, two, three, and four, five on them? Those squares out in the channel? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, they're up, up between the two. Uh, up the, they'll come up this way. <laughs> and. Uh, Nope, I'm sorry. But anyway, here's Savile Island. See, Tulagi's right here. In the Black Canal. Here's, here's all we have in the airstrip. Yep, that's all. Of the Black Canal. But anyway, around the Savile Island, there was this huge sea battle. And we lost four cruisers that night. And so our fleet, that was the aircraft carriers, all the destroyers, cruisers, battleships, and our supply ships, the troop ships, took off, went back to New Caledonia, took most of our supplies with us. So we were left there with no, practically no supplies. We had to subside on, on Japanese rice and for several weeks. That's about all we ate was Japanese rice once a week, once a day. And uh, because they had, you know, we took some with us, you know, for about you know, two or three days on our pack, but once they were gone, but, that we had to rely on the Japanese rice for it. And so that's why uh, they could land any place. We had no protection. In fact, on Sea Lark Channel, there was a fellow by the name of Reveille Joe, who was a destroyer. He'd come and cruise up and down between Tulagi and Guadalcanal and lob a few shells here and there, you know, over, some over Tulagi, some over Guadalcanal, just to, to harass you. And uh, so that was one, that was, that was uh, Lovely Joe. And we have Louis Lee Laos, who worshipped King Charles, and Pistol Pete, I should tell about those later. Were they, were they ships? No, no, no. Uh, well, yeah, uh, Lovely Joe was. He was a, he was a, a, a job can destroyer. Pistol Pete was a piece of artillery up in the hills. He used to shell us when they'd bomb, they'd, they would shell us at the same time. It took us a while to realize it. See, there's a difference between a bomb dropping and a, and a shell coming in. A bomb is like a whistling sound, and, and a, 
uh, artillery is kind of whoosh, 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 you know. And we'd be in our bunker and we'd hear that whoosh. That's not bombs. So we found out it was a pistol peat up in the hills. And, uh, and then Wash Machine Charlie or uh, Louis DeLaus, he was just a, 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 sick, a small plane that would come over and drop small bombs, you know, just to harass us so we would get some sleep. So that's what, that's what those guys were. Did, did um, support ever come back? Hmm? You said that they left. Did they ever come back? Oh, yeah, they eventually got back, yes. And, uh, well, you've, you've studied the Battle of Midway, haven't you? Mm, I don't think so. Midway, yeah. Midway? Oh, yeah. Midway, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, see, that was a turning point in the sea, bat in the sea because they lost, what, four, four uh, aircraft carriers. And so they didn't, they didn't have the protection for their fleets at that point, the air protect. And uh, so after that, then, and then after this, this Battle of Savo, uh, then our ships finally got back. Yeah, and they didn't, uh, well, it was in the uh, final part of September when, uh, when they finally did get back and brought more troops in in October. And said, no, the Seventh Marines came in from Samoa in, in September. And uh, they're the ones that brought another rifle. Now, uh, do you know anything about rifles or anything? <laughs> um. Well, they're, they're listed at the top there. Okay. They are. That, uh, the first one up there, you see it, the Springfield 03? Yep. That is a World War I rifle. That's the rifle I carry all the way through Guadalcanal. Really? And then you go on down and there's a Grand or an M1. Department. Oh, yep. Okay, now that's a semi-automatic. In other words, they could, you could push one and pull another one, you know. It's not like a machine gun where you pull the trigger and, you know, like that. Right. You have to pull each one. But with the the old three, you had to work a bolt to shoot, you know, push another one in. So the uh, seven Marines in October, uh, no, September, came, brought the, uh, the M1 on. That was a little surprise to the Japs, too, because they were used to our guys having to work the bolt. They'd get up and toss a pineapple at you. But when they get up and do it, well, the seven Marines would pick them off. You know, and and uh, so that, that's antiquated. <laughs> weapons that what we had. And the biggest uh, weapon we had was a 60 millimeter mortar. That was big, and our machine guns were air-cooled. They were the light air-cooled machine guns, not the big heavy mm -hmm. water-cooled. Um, were there any memorable personal experiences on Guad Guadalcanal for you? Like... Well, uh, see our as I told member, I said our, we had about 900 people on our battalion, but we were in existence only two years, and in two years, 2,400 guys went through the battalion. So we had a few casualties here and there. And, uh, and after Tulagi, Guadalcanal, and then later on New Georgia, of the original 900, there were 200 of us left. And I, you know, there's another fellow who's down in Fort Edward, Jerry West, neither one of us got wounded at all. And uh, now, close calls? Sure. When we left, we back and we left Tulagi and went over to Guadalcanal, we were on one of these APDs, the Calhoun. And it was in the afternoon, and we got over to Guadalcanal, and they were debating whether to leave us aboard ship and take us ashore in the morning or take us ashore then. So they decided to take us ashore. And before we hit the beach, there was an air raid, and the ship was sunk. Two minutes it went down, and was it. So that was, I figured that was a kind of a close call for me. And, uh, and later on, another one I can remember as close was uh, on the Battle of Bloody Ridge. Uh, the last morning, they had a, a range on that ridge of their knee mortars and machine guns. And uh, uh, the, these knee mortars are like a large hand grenade. And I was up there, and one came right at me, right at me, and lit within two feet of me, and rolled down the hill, and it went off. <laughs> so that's, and uh, there were, of course, there were many, many other, I'm sure, other, other, other incidents when, you know, you'd see tracers going, you'd see, 
Well, let's see. A tracer here. I don't know if you know what a tracer is. It's uh, uh, when a machine gun fires. Well, they have tracers in them. About every seventh bullet is one you can see. Well, in between there is about six or seven others. And you say, gee, you see the tracers. What are the rest of them? You know, and they would be hitting the trees above you and that kind of stuff. And, uh, so there. Uh, no. So anyway, there. <laughs> now, what was your question? <laughs> Oh, before? Memorable experiences for you, like... Well, those are, those are some of the experiences I had, and of course, the food. You had a question on there about food. Well, as I say, we ate Jap rice for a long time, and we finally got food came in. Well, it was mainly uh, dehydrated potatoes, dehydrated milk, Spam, Vienna sausage, and corn, we call it corn willy big cans of corned beef, stringy stuff, you know. That was our diet, so uh, uh, it took me a long time before I could eat rice or corned beef. <laughs> that's right, I'm back. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about Bloody Ridge? Bloody Ridge, okay. Uh, well, we knew they were land after we went over to the, over the water canal. And we knew they were landing. And, uh, they, and there was a, a village called Tassaboko. Uh, that would be down to your right. Down right here? Yeah. And uh, it was a village, and of course uh, there were no natives there. The Japs had drawn them all up, up into the hills. And so after we, well, we, we went down and we went aboard our APDs, and we only had two or three of them by then. And then we went down on some other, what they called banana boats. I don't know. They were, and uh, anyway, we had to go down in two shifts, one, in one, one evening, and then the rest of us came down in the morning and, uh, and went ashore and to pull raid down there because we knew they were there. Well, prior to our landing, the main force had moved back up into the jungles. and. Uh, I think there was probably about 3,500 of them. But there were, they left four pieces of artillery there, which they were going to use on us when they attacked us. So we destroyed the artillery. We pulled it out to sea. We, just, we blew up an ammunition dump. We destroyed the food that we couldn't carry back with us. And uh, they had bicycles and everything there. And uh, so, uh, that, uh, and then, and then, so then we did, did all that stuff and got back aboard ship and went back up. And we got into that perimeter defense. There was a spot on this longer ridge that wasn't covered. So that's where we were, because Colonel Edson, he had served in China before the war. So he knew these jobs. And in fact, sometimes he knew what they were going to do before they did. And he just knew that that was where they were going to attack. And he finally convinced General Vandergrift that, that that's where we should set up our defense. And he did. And that's where they attacked. 3,500 of them attacked 700 of us on that ridge. And it was two nights, two nights a day. With, and again, nights. They fought at night. And uh, we would have support. We would have not patrols, but listening posts out around. You know, a couple of them got overrun. I was out on one. Fortunately, it, uh, they didn't come to me. You know, there's Jerry West, who lives down outside of Fort Edward. He said, after our book came out, he said he couldn't sleep for two nights because he found out that he was on an outpost out there and a whole battalion of Japanese passed within 100, 100 yards of him. He didn't even know it until he read the book. <laughs> so, uh, and when I was out on this outpost, you, uh, you would stand guard. You would never stand guard by yourself because your imagination could do a lot of things with you. Always two of you. The fellow was with me. He was approaching, start, the pro daylight was coming. And he says, I hear something. And I said, well, good. And you were, we had to stand watch with our bayonets fixed because Warren Talagi, the first night, everybody was shooting, boom, 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 you know, you know they just, uh, and the word came down, fix bayonets. If you see somebody, we want to see blood the next day on your bayonet. So that's why they said you had to stand watch with your bayonets fixed. And uh, 
So we were with bandits fixed, and this guy kept saying, somebody coming, somebody coming, somebody coming. And I tried to be a little, I, I was always optimistic. I, they, I, I never thought it was as bad as they tried to tell us it was. But anyway, and finally he says, I'm going to get him. And so he'd lunge and he'd go, Ugh, you know, you feel me? Well, when it did get a little lighter, it took about a half hour to dig his bed out of the tree he stuck, you know, so he, <laughs> he was one of those. And, and, uh, but prior to our going over there, uh, this battle of Tenaru, they, they tried to take it back with a thousand men. And I said, these were guys who had never lost before, and so they thought they were invincible, but the Marines just sucked them in and, and uh, killed them over about 20 of them. So that was the first time. And it was just through the stupidity of the Japanese that they did not take the airstrip back. Because they tried to take it back in one, up, up from one air uh, with a thousand men. They tried to take it back on Bloody Ridge with 3,500. And then later on, up at the Matanica, up the other way, they tried to take it back up there. If they would have waited and attacked from all three spots at the same time, there's no way we could have defended it. We just didn't have the personnel to do it with. But, uh, so they, uh, so that was, a, and they left about 1,400 of them. You saw the picture of it in that book, what they left behind. We had about 50% casualties, not all killed, but about 50% casualties at those two nights. And, uh, so, and then we came off of the ridge, and we was in the coconut grove, that's where our bivouac area was. And uh, then they needed us up at the botanic cow up the other way. And uh, now in the meantime, our colonel, see, uh, a, a battalion commander is a lieutenant colonel. Well, he had made full colonel. And uh, so after Bloody Ridge, well, then they gave, made him the commander of the 5th Regiment. See, you have battalions, and then you have regiments and, and divisions. Well, he, he was made the commander. CO of the 5th Regiment, and that's where they were up at Matanica. And we went up and tried to do, but we were unsuccessful. And uh, now, on the Battle of Bloody Ridge, two of our members received a Congressional Medal of Honor for that night, Colonel Edson and Major Bailey. Well, up at the Matanica, Major Bailey, like all of our officers, they weren't going to say, you go here, you go there, and then follow me. And so he was leading, and he got killed up there at the Botanica. And, uh, and so, and our uh, second in command, who was then take, took over, uh, Griffith, he was wounded that night, that, that day too. Mm -hmm. So then when we came back from the, from the Botanica, well, we were in this coconut grove, and they say, okay, there were, oh, I don't know, there were 300 of us left in. And uh, they said, oh, you're the reserves of the reserves. You won't be called out unless the island's in danger of being taken. So, a few days later, A and C companies putting their gear. Where are they going? Well, Edson wants them to come up and guard his CP. Okay. So, next morning, put your gear, where are we going? Well, they had to use A and C company last night, so we're going up and guard the CP. Fortunately, that's all we did do. But uh, our A company mortar squad was digging in up there at the Matanica. And uh, there were some Japs on our side of the Matan. They were on the other side, we were on one side, but some of them had gotten over. And they were trying to get back to their own men before the tide came in. They could go across the foot, you know, the, the uh, mouth of the river. And they ran into our A Company mortar squad uh, section. And we could hear it. We could hear it. And uh, Edson was going nuts because he thought they were coming the other way. He says, Are you telling me you got a hold? You got a hold? But what it was, they were trying to get back and ran into them. And our guys had, were digging in, and there were no shots. The next day, we found nine of our Marines and over 60 Japs who were dead from that hand to hand, all hand to hand. So that's, and, uh, and about five days later, we left the island. Those guys were that close to leaving the island, but they, they just didn't make it. And they brought in some army, and, and then we left in, in, August, in October. So, that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Um, did you have any, like, close contact with Japanese soldiers or anything like that? 
Like, did you take any prisoners or have any hand-to-hand -hand combat? I did not have any hand-to-hand. -hand. And we took very, very few prisoners. On Tulagi, they went in these caves and they wouldn't come out, so they would seal them up. Forget about them, you know, and they, they, they wouldn't come out and surrender. And I don't think, I think, I don't think, they, a few of them surrendered, but not to us. Other people had come on the island. When we went on the island, we had, we had pieces of burlap on our helmets, painted green. Our faces were blackened. For why, I know, we don't know. But they were, and uh, they know who we were, you know. They, the reason for the burlap was to break that, you know, the, the helmet was round, and so this would give you a little more, whatever, camouflage. And a couple of them did surrender to somebody else, and they said, don't let the man with the socks on their hats get us. So, so they didn't want to surrender to them. And uh, they just didn't bother, you know. They, they, and we took very, very few prisoners. And on, on the ridge, we didn't take any prisoners because they, they took back off into the jungles again. And, uh, so, and they called it, you know, the Hell Island, the Japanese, because they had to live out in the jungles. We were in the base, you know, and they, they they lost, as you can see on there, 26,000 men. A lot of them died of uh, starvation and diseases, you know, that they were had out of. And, uh, and when they finally left, well, they left 26,000 of them there. And, uh, Did you see the conditions of any of their camps? And compared to ours, were they the same or? What was that? The conditions of camps, like, did you see any Japanese camps and compared to ours? Oh, no, they, no. They... Well, they didn't have any camps there. Uh -huh. No camps. Just at Casablanca, that was a village, that was a native village, you know. No, we didn't see any camps at all. Because they just lived in the jungle. <laughs> and uh, they never moved about in this time. And, uh, so. Um, what what did the battalion do after Guadalcanal? Where were they sent? All right, I say when uh, when the army came in, there were about three thousand army came in and relieved about three hundred of us. That's what we had left. Of course, they weren't all killed, but they were, you know left for sickness, wounded, whatever. And uh, we went back to New Caledonia. We were there a little while, and just prior to Thanksgiving, there was a ship. A transport going down to Wellington, New Zealand, to go into dry dock. And they say, okay, you can go down to New Zealand, be, stay as long as that ship stays in dry dock. And so we got down, we were out on, the, on the way down on Thanksgiving. Of course, they had prepared on the board ship a nice turkey dinner, but there were so many of us. By the time I got to mine, I had cold cuts. But it was still better what they were eating up in Guadalcanal. And uh, so we got down there shortly after Thanksgiving, and we spent holidays down in uh, New Zealand, Wellington, New Zealand, and uh, that was a memorable experience too because all we had to do was stand roll call at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's all they wanted us to do, <laughs> stand roll call. And, but over Christmas they gave us three days. We didn't have to come back for three days. So I went down to the local YMCA and in their gymnasium they had bunk beds set up, you know, to take care of servicemen and whatever. So I got myself a bed and they would give you a, a breakfast. And it would cost you two and six for a bread and breakfast, 40 cents. And after I'd made arrangements, I came walking out of there, and some elderly lady stopped me on the street. She says, do you have a place to eat Christmas dinner tomorrow? And I says, no. Well, she says, would you like to come out to my house? I said, sure, fine. So she gave me the address and the phone number and says, if you got any other buddies, why well, let know. So I inquired around. Most everybody had something to do, so I called her. OK, so she tell me, gave me the address. 12 Apuka Street, A-P-U-K-A, -A. I still remember that. And her name was Lamberton, Mrs. Lamberton. She was probably in her late 60s, maybe early 70s. And we got out there, there were a couple other American sailors, a couple of New Zealand sailors. Her grandson was there, who later went in the New, York, uh, the New Zealand uh, Royal Air Force. And we had a Christmas dinner out there, and that was my first experience with pudding, plum pudding. I was eating mine, and all of a sudden, clank, what? Some money. And I didn't say anything. It was a threepence. You know, in fact, you know, there was a penny, there was a threepence, a sixpence, a shilling, and a half crown, whatever, you know. 
And then somebody said, oh, I got a sewing, I got this and that. So what they did, they put money in a pudding. I didn't know. <laughs> so anyway, and I still got that, that, that thruppence at home. And uh, so, and we, we uh, corresponded for several years after that. And, uh, so that was a blunt experience. And then when I got back to New Caledonia, I got a letter from my younger brother. He's about 16 months younger than I was. And I knew he'd gone in the Army. And uh, so I got a letter from him, and he was in the 181st Army Engineers. And he said, uh, in the letter, he said they spoke French where he was. He said, well, he's either got to be here in New Caledonia or up at the Hebrides. And one of the fellows in my outfit says, I think I saw that sign, 181st Engineers. So, so I got a day off and was, went into Numia, which was the capital of, of uh, New Caledonia. And I got in a truck. We all rode just in a truck. I got right over the cab and I told the driver, now if I pound on a cab, let me off, please. so, and uh, sure enough, there was a sign, 181st Engineers pointing up, so I pound on the cab, he stopped, and I, got, I was walking up the hill, three trucks were coming down, and all of a sudden one slammed out of brakes and my brother was driving one of them. <laughs> so we were together there for a few months, and uh, he'd come out to see me, I didn't see him, he came out one day and we were gone. That's when we... Went up, back up to, Duca, up to Guadalcanal for a little more training. In the meantime, we'd gotten in replacements to build back up to our 900. And uh, so we're then from North Guadalcanal. We got aboard ships on July 4th, 1943. We went up to New Georgia. Now, uh, <clears throat> New Georgia, there was another, there was an airstrip there called Munda, and, uh, which, we, which they were using, which we had to get away from them. And, uh, but on the north side of the island, there were two supply bases up there called Anagai and Bairoku. And it was our job to go up and knock them out. And uh, we did knock out Anagai, but we never did actually knock out Bairoku because we didn't have the, the, the weapons to do it with. And, and I figured my brother probably was there because the engineers, and they were building a road from after they'd secured the airstrip one over to Bairoku. And uh, I figured he was there, but I wasn't about to take off in the jungle looking for him. And uh, so uh, he came out and we were gone. But after the war, we got together. Yes, he had been on Monday. And uh, now we went up to New Georgia. We landed up, up at Rice Anchorage, away from Anagai. We went, we were five days through jungles and swamps, coming in behind the Japanese. They never figured we'd come that way, which we did, you know, be in the swamp anywhere from your knees to your armpits. And uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, just, and, and we surprised them. And it was a good thing we did because they had four six inch guns there, but they couldn't turn them around and use them once so they could point them out to sea. They had brought them up from Singapore. And uh, now across the way, Kolomangara, 10,000 Japs over there. And we could see plane. They could see us. We could see over there. It wasn't too far away. But what we would do, after we secured Enagai, we would take our landing craft, go down to where we had race anchorage, and we'd be standing up in the boat. And we'd go down there and get supplies and start some fires. And then come back, we'd stay down so they couldn't see it. We knew they were watching us. And so then, after that night, they'd come over and bomb down there. And we laughed, and went, nobody down there, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but if they would have known, 10,000 of them over there, if they'd have known there was only a couple of Italians of us over there, they, they could have come over and wiped us out. But again, it was through there. And in that area, now you remember hearing the story of John Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, PT boats. Can you study that? Yeah. No. That's where he was. And he got rammed by a Jap destroyer, his PT boat. Well, he was in that area between uh, North New Caledonia and Colomagara. That's where he was. And uh, that's where he got a bad back, you know, he got a bad back. So, uh, so then uh, and one day we sent us a plot, we sent a patrol down towards Enigar, down to Roko, and somebody got killed. 
And we come back. And the next day, we knew they were doing something. We could hear them pounding and all this stuff. And there was a lot of activity between Barroco and Quillam and Garrett. And the next day, the Army had been building a road. And they, they walked in, nobody there. <laughs> so they had left. They, they, so at that point, they figured out. So that's, uh, and we left. Uh, then, let's see, we had what? About, oh, about 300 was left after Guadalcanal, and there were about 6, 650 of us left after New Georgia. And I say, but of the original 900, there were only 200 of us. And then we went back to Guadalcanal, then then back down to Guad, to New, New Mia, New Caledonia, and I came back to the States. Good. Um, could you tell me a little bit about Edson? Edson, well, I told you something. That he, he got his, uh, yeah, he's got it. Uh, once a legend. And uh, it's all about Edson. And he had been down to uh, Nicaragua, and he fought down there, the, the bandits and down in those jungles. That's where he learned his jungle warfare. And he got World War, Navy Cross, and everything down there. He served in China. But I say he was a real leader. He was a little guy. He was probably about five six, and uh, had his helmet on. It looked like it was always too big for him, and uh, and he was always right up front. After we came off of Bloody Ridge, he had bullet holes through his uniform, and uh, but never Mr. got one. Mr. Huntington, please call me in office. Mr. Huntington, please call me in office. That was one thing he always wasn't too happy about it. He never got a Purple Heart. <laughs> but he had, I say, bullet holes. And his Major Bailey, the day after, when they came off the ridge, they were back talking to the general. And Major Bailey, he had been wounded on Tulagi and had gone to New Caledonia and then hitched a ride on a ship back up to Guadalcanal and was there for that Battle of Bloody Ridge. And he had helm, bullet holes through his helmet, nicked his head, everything else. So he, Colonel Edson and Major Bailey were talking to Vandergrift, and then Vandergrift told him, and he had a bloody face, and he says, Ken, that was his first name, he says, you better go check out a new helmet. He says, he had bullet holes in his helmet. But he was one, unfortunately, he didn't make it up at the, up at the botanic column. But Edson, as I say, he was, the guys would follow him any place, you know, because that's just the way he was. He, he would encourage you, he, you know, you could talk to him, and he he, he was a leader, a real leader, and, uh, and he retired as a major general. And, uh, and uh, as a slip there, it says how many, uh, what, what awards <coughs> this battalion got. Four guys got the Congressional Medal of Honor, and there were many, many Navy crosses and all that stuff. And I think this comes to what? That, no, that, 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 yeah, down at the bottom, what is it, 380 or 280 total? 321. 321. That's how many awards. You can see Navy crosses, all the kinds of things. And seven fellows became generals. And that other sheet you just put down, there's 24 names of ships that are named after fellows from this one battalion. And, uh, and they still say that this is probably the outstanding battalion. And when I came back from overseas, people said, well, what's the difference between American servicemen and Japanese? I said, well, and it goes for the Germans, too. We were taught to think for ourselves. And we could make decisions where they couldn't. Now, on the Battle of Bloody Ridge, they just pulled these bonsai attacks, you know, straight on, straight on, straight on. We had nothing to our left, nothing. All, if they'd have probed and probed, they could have surrounded us. But no, they go boom, 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 you know, this. And they couldn't think. And, and D on, uh, you haven't studied D or D Day yet, I'm sure, on, in the history, have you? Yeah. yeah. Well, on D Day, there were many, many cases of non commissioned officers, junior officers, making major decisions. And yet there was a German general who had some tanks, and he knew what he had to do, but he couldn't do it because he didn't get orders from above. And Rommel was off for a birthday party for his wife, and Hitler was sleeping, and no way did you ever wake up Hitler, I guess. 
So the poor guy, he could make, he could, he knew what he had to do, but he couldn't do it. But if you're American, he'd have, he'd have done it. And, uh, because you know, you, you got to make these decisions and do them, and, and, and that's what we were taught. We were taught to think for ourselves, and also we were fighting to come home. We weren't fighting to be in honor for him. We call the emperor or anything, you know. And uh, so, and what else? Uh, there's a couple other things here. And uh, as I say, <clears throat> I was no hero. I never got wounded, but I was where I was supposed to be, when I was supposed to be there, doing what I was supposed to be doing. And you weren't fighting for the United States. You weren't fighting for the Marine Corps. You were fighting for each other. Because you know, if you didn't do what you were supposed to do, you were going to endanger somebody else. And they all felt the same way. You, you were fighting for each other. And uh, then you talked about prisoners. There's a, a difference in the way prisoners were treated. Uh, you probably heard about read about the Baton Death March, you know that thing. And uh, I told you about these APDs. Well, one another one of them got sunk. And uh, after we had. Uh, Pulled a, a, a we'd gone over to some of them take, taking some of our guys over to Sabo to make sure there were no Japs there. Well, our guys had just left that ship when there were some more sea ballots, uh, Navy ships, Jap Navy ships came, and, and then this other, this APD got sunk, and that Jap destroyer ran through these guys in the water and machine gunned them. That's the way they treated prisoners, you know, in the Yet, when we left the island, there were some Japanese prisoners on this transport we had, we got on. They had been picked up from one of the sea battles and then transferred to this and were taken back to New Caledonia or something. But they had clean sheets, clean blankets, pillowcases, pillows. All we had was a bare mattress to sleep on. And yet, that's the way they treated the prisoners, you know. And we had to, they were down in a hole the hole was empty, it, you know, and uh, that's where they fed them. Of course, we were up with, you know, watching them go. But they would, they come out and bow, you know, and all this stuff. But because uh, they know that they were being treated very nicely. And that was a big difference between the way we treated prisoners. And uh, uh, of course, on our training, one reason why we were we were, you know different, better than other Marine Corps units, from the day one we went in, we were told, you are the best of the best. And, and you just, you know, you're the best. and uh, so, and of course I told you about our leadership, our officers didn't say, you go here, you go there, follow me. And, they went. and, uh, uh, and we had ingenuity too, you know, uh, we have a couple of cases, <laughs> we were at Tulagi, uh, the general had, uh, he didn't get along, or, or Colonel didn't get along with the general anyway. But uh, he, he was in one of these houses and up on a hill, and of course when Drever Lee Joe would come, uh, his staff would wake him up maybe an hour before and come down and go into a cave, you know. Well, we were set up with our mortars to protect the beach in case they landed. And there's one fellow by the name Andy Dovey, he'd gone off watch, and we were there. He went into this, into this cave and he strung up a, a bunch of wires and tin cans and everything else, you know, in case somebody come in and make a lot of noise and wake him up. Well, in come this general with his entourage going right through this. Oh, they read. Oh, they were mad. They read oh, they they read off poor Andy Doby and ran him up to Colonel Edson, you know, and all that stuff. And I'm sure it was all Colonel Edson could do, keep from laughing right in the general's face. And later, he congratulated Andy on his ingenuity. <laughs> and uh, now we had another incident up on New Georgia. And this fellow by the name of Jinx Powers, he was a great singer. We, we was a singing outfit. We had a, I got a book of all our songs, you know, the, the cleaned up versions of them. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, and he was one of them. They had a group called the Eight Balls which sang. And there they have recently recorded our songs and it's the Library of Congress. That's, uh, but anyway. On New George, he got wounded as we were coming in to try to take our uh, Anna guy, but he could walk. And so somebody said, Doc, Jinx, get back to the 
first aid station and tell them we could use some help out here. Well, he went the wrong way. Somehow it got mixed up and he went the wrong way and realized he was back in Jeff territory. So, well, he says, they climbed a tree, so he climbed a tree. He was up in a tree. And so he was up there, I don't know, over about two days or something. And finally, some of our guys, Stu Polonis and a few others, were out looking for jinx. And he could hear them coming. But he says, now, if I yell at them, they're probably going to shoot me. So he started to sing Mamie Riley, the song Mamie Riley. And he said, oh, that's jinx. Let's go again. <laughs> so he used his ingenuity there. And of course, you, 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 you had to use your sense of humor, too. You always couldn't lose your sense of humor. I remember when we were up on uh, Garden Edson CP up at the Botanic uh, guys were saying, well, what are we going to do when we get back to the States? You know, well, we're going to train other, these other guys. And one guy says, well, I won't play unless I can use the Roman candles. That's what Japs used Roman candles to, you know, make believe they were firing at you. When they draw your fire, when they see where you are, then they'd shoot you. And, uh, and then, of course, on Tulagi, we had a chaplain. He came around once and he says, you know, when I get out of this, he was from Chicago, he says, I'm going to get 100 raiders and paratroopers and go back and clean out the underworld of Chicago. <laughs> so that's what he did. And uh, so, and we talk about our, our people who got, uh, became generals. One of them became a four-star general, but became an assistant ring, assistant commander of the Marine Corps. Really well. He was a captain when I was in the outfit. He was a four-star general. And uh, now, now communications. You, uh, you know, for anything going on in Iraq, instantly we know about it, right? Instantly. Well. We had what we call coast watchers. I don't know if you told them about the coast watchers or not, but up, up the string of islands, the Solomon Islands and on up, there were these Australian coast watchers. And they would relay messages when they would see Betty's uh, airplanes, Jap airplanes coming our way, or ships coming down the slot. And, uh, but to get the information to us, they had to send it to Australia, who sent it to Pearl Harbor, who Pearl Harbor had to send it to us. That's how we got information from them, which they were maybe a thousand miles away or a hundred miles away. And that, that's the way the communication was back in those days. And it took them 10, 15, 20 minutes for us to get that information. And now it's just like that, you know. And uh, so anyway, that's, uh, now, you know, I'm, I don't know, you've got other questions or anything, but just uh, Tokyo Road, you heard what Tokyo Road's? No, I don't, I don't think so. Axis Sally. You haven't got those yet, huh? Well, Tokyo Rose was, she had been, she was a, a Japanese, but she was American citizen. And she'd gone to Japan just for the war. And of course, when the war broke out, they grabbed her and said, no, if you don't want anything to happen to your family, you'll do what we tell you to do. So she was propaganda, you know, and uh, to us, you know. And, uh, and she did us a favor twice. And, uh, you know, she'd play all this music. Just think of these guys. You think of it, you fellows. You could be back home with your girls and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Well, she came out and said, the 1st Marine Raider Battalion has been annihilated on Guadalcanal. So we were permitted to write home and say where we were then. Couldn't otherwise say. And when got New Georgia, she did the same thing. 1st Marine Raider Battalion has been annihilated. So we could write home and say we were on New Georgia. Couldn't say where we'd been, but we could tell where. And uh, so, there's other things, and uh, Why is at that? one time after our fleet had left us, then we were called the, the Marooned Division. <laughs> Not the Marine Division, but the Marooned Division were all there. Why were you called the Marooned Division? Huh? The Marooned Division? Marooned. You know, we were just left to fence for ourselves and everything for a while. And, uh, and then there was, uh, there was an epitaph that was on one of the Marines that got killed, a PCFC um, camera on cross on the cemetery in Guadalcanal. It says, and when he goes to heaven, to St. Peter he will tell, another Marine, Marine for army, sir, I've served my time in hell. And, uh, so, got other questions now? Or what? <laughs> um, you can keep, do you have anything more you want to say about that? Do you have no, anything no. else right well, now? Then I would usually go into my presentation of, you know, how, of, of, the, of all the maps and all that stuff I have and stuff. Why did they let you write home? Hmm? After uh, Tokyo Rose announced 
that they yeah. annihilated, why why all of a sudden would they let you write home, the Marine? Well, we could write home, but we couldn't say where we were. Okay. Yeah, we could write home, but we just couldn't say where we were. But, but then we could write. And uh, however, when I came back, I remember my dad, he was working in the bowling alley. And uh, of course, he'd have to go in, he'd work nights, you know, to get the bowling alley, alleys ready for the next day. He lived, we lived at the Alliance, and he worked in Canton, which was about 18 miles away. And he'd win our early road sometimes, you know, and it was right after they got my first letter when I went overseas, this one from Guadalcanal. And there was some guy there complaining, oh, he can't get this, he can't get this because of the stupid war, you know, rations this, rations that. He says, here, read this. So he handed my letter to him. There was another word. <laughs> he says, you think you got a bad, what do you think of me? And here, read this. Well, I was telling him I was on Guadalcanal. Never heard another word from him. <laughs> Just describing it? Huh? Describing your conditions and what you're living through? And... No, just that I was on Guadalcanal, that's all. Oh, okay. Just, just, just there. And he knew, just hearing the word Guadalcanal probably what it was like. Yeah. Of course, had any of you heard of Guadalcanal before you took this course? Mm, probably not. I See, the word Guadalcanal to me is just like you, Hudson Falls, Lens Falls, Queensbury, Fort Edward, you know, Guadalcanal, Tulagi, Tassimboco, Matanical, Anakai, Baroque over there, all, you know, ingrained in me, and I'll never forget them. And it's like, you know, just like yesterday, mm -hmm. 63 years ago. Did you know Jerry West when you were on Guadalcanal? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I knew him when I went in the outfit. He was he he, he joined the Marine Corps before the war. So when I went in the outfit, he was a corporal. Okay. And yeah, oh yeah, we he was in, we were both in 81 millimeter mortars, you know. And when he did away with that, then we went to demolition school. And I went overseas as a demolition. He stayed in it, and, but uh, they had enough guys already in it, so I went back to A Company and uh, or. Uh, E, e Company in uh, 60, mil 60 millimeter mortars. And, uh, and I, you know, recently I've been thinking, why was I put in, in the mortars and not a rifle company? And I, I know why. I was not a sharpshooter. I had never fired a weapon before I went to the Marine Corps and haven't fired one since. And uh, so any time I ever fired was out of the Marine Corps. And, uh, and I wasn't a sharpshooter, and so I didn't want me in a rifle company, so they put me in the mortars. So, but they like my background of, you know, I was telling them how boot camp was not as rough to me as high school football out in Ohio. And I think they, this Major Bailey, the one I told, he was a captain then, he's the one that interviewed me. He played professional football at Cleveland with the uh, Chicago Bears. And, uh, so I think that's why I got into Raiders, but I wasn't a sharpshooter, so they put me in mortars. Amy, did you ask why the Raiders were disbanded? No, I was getting to that, but... Oh, I thought you were done. No. I didn't mean to take over your interview. <laughs> what was that? Um, <laughs> I was going to ask a few things about the Raiders. About I read in the book that it was controversial creating the Raiders, and I was wondering if you um, you were aware of the controversy. Oh, what was that? Like, were you aware of the controversy that creating the Raider Battalion Oh, yes, yes. Made? Uh, at the time, no. And, uh, oh, most of the stuff I'm telling you, I, I found out afterwards. As I said, I was an optimist. I didn't, I didn't believe them when they said how bad it was. It was so bad that Washington had told Vandegrift to surrender. That's how bad they thought it was. But they, he never told us. Mm -hmm. But later, as I started reading all this stuff, I found out they were they were not right. It was worse than they were telling to tell us it was. Because uh, Vandegrift in that uh, do or die, the men do or die men, he states at the beginning there that if someone went to Marine Corps schools or any military course and was given this as a project, now what you need to go into here, and if they would have put down what they what the first division went in with, they would have flunked the course. Because we just didn't have 
He didn't have his whole division. He did. We had uh, some of them were come up from New Zealand, some were in Australia, some were in Samoa, some was aboard ship still coming up when they made the decision that they had to take Guadalcanal. So they were all over the place. And the first time they got all together was when we went up to the Fijis. And, uh, and that was a fiasco <laughs> up at the Fijis. It just didn't, no, no, nothing went right at all. What happened at the Fijis? Well, that's where we pulled maneuvers prior to going up to Tulagi and Guadalcanal. We pulled maneuvers. And nothing worked. But, it, we, uh, but it, it turned out all right. Because uh, I said, it was what, what, they call, what they call the shoestring operation. Because all the efforts were put in Europe at the time. You know. mm -hmm. And of course, too along too well with MacArthur either. But, uh, we had a name for him. Uh, did you ever tell him what our name was? Was it Dugout Doug? Dugout Doug, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it all worked out. I mean, the, the army that came on the canal, they, they, they did a very good job. Eventually, they did a very good job there. What, what does Dugout Doug mean? Hmm? Like, how, how, is it an insult calling what? someone Dugout Doug? Dugout Doug. Yeah, well, he was always back in the dugout someplace, not up front like our, our commanding officer and generals were, you know. And, uh, and, well, I don't know, you used to see pictures of him wading ashore, leading the troops, going back to the Philippines. Somebody's got to be ashore taking those pictures of him, you know. <laughs> he, he was a great publicity man, but, I mean, no, he, he was a great soldier, he was a, he was a great general. You just have this, you know, you know I, said, I always said, you know, the Army and the Navy, they were our allies also. So mm -hmm. And, of course, we technically were part of the Navy. Marines, Marines were part, part of the Navy. Because we, we couldn't go any place without the Navy. They had the transporters. They furnished <laughs> medical men. We, we had no medical corps. They had our do doctors and, and corpsmen, chaplains, and uh, another great outfit in the Navy were the Seabees. They came on and and finished that airstrip, you know. And because uh, they were, because they, they, you know, we always got to give us that friend. And these APDs you're talking about, those guys just became like brothers to us, you know. They would send stuff ashore to us, and, and when you would stand there and watch this Jap destroyer going right through them after they'd sunk the ship, it, it, that made their guys kind of loyal a little bit, you know, because they, they were like brothers to us, because you'd live with them. Um, despite the Raiders' fight record, they were disbanded. Could Do you know why? The Raiders disbanded? Yeah. Well, technically we weren't disbanded. We were done away with because as you moved out of the jungle, swampy areas, going north, there wasn't a call for that smaller type operation and fighting and jungle fighting. You were much bigger off. And so what they did, well, we go. Prior to, World War, uh, prior to World War II, you break, uh, when, when it broke out, the 4th Marine Regiment was in the Philippines and mostly Guam and around. Of course, they were annihilated, you know, not annihilated, but they lost their colors. And they just didn't want to form another 4th Regiment out of recruits. And so they were waiting. And so when they decided to do away with the Raiders, there were four Raider battalions by then. And Jimmy Roosevelt, who was President Roosevelt's son, was the CO of the 4th Marine Raider Battalion. He was adjutant to Carlson's 2nd Raiders. And uh, those four Raider Battalions, they decided to make the 4th Regiment. So they just stayed as the 4th Regiment, stayed out there. Now the paratroopers, they did disband them. I mean, they're going to drop, you know, there was no, 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 no way you could parachute people in any place out there. So they fought with us. They, they took uh, Gavudu and, Sa and uh, oh, there's two little islands there, uh, Kanaboko, and, uh, and then they fought with us on, on the Bloody Ridge. And then they left. Now they were a very small battalion, only about 300 and some. And I guess it was less than 100 of them left when they, they left the island before we did. And then they eventually brought them all back to the States. That was after we came back. 
and just did away with the, with the paratroopers. And I remember when I came back to the States, I was put full of MP duty on the Camp Elliott, on the base, on the main gate. And I was there the night they came in with trucks and, oh, your turn next. And they, they no sooner hit the street and they were out the main gate, wanted to go across the street to the slop chute with the beer joint. We looked at hey, you don't know, even look like Marines. You can't go up. Well, we just got, I said, we told them, we came back and we went through the process. And then when we got our uniforms squared away, and then we got leave, then we went home. So we went back, you know. And but some of them did then finally get downtown San Diego and they were, oh, they had their belt, their, their jackets this way and their belts here and this hat. Some of our guys were MPs down in <laughs> San Diego. They would come up to us and say, Mac, come on, straighten up, look like a Marine. We, oh, we just come back, okay, call the wagon, throw it away. <laughs> you know. And that, none of them had ever gone seen combat. They, they were not any of, the, any of the guys that fought with us. They were just guys that had gone over and they'd made par uh, paratroopers out of them. So but our guys didn't have a useful them. Forget about it, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and we, we still get together every year. We have a reunion every year. And we've been getting together, going out of Quantico, we're reformed. And uh, this will be the 63rd anniversary, 64th, 64th. We'll probably have one more after that, be the 65th. Because uh, we're losing 15, 20, we lost 25 last year. That was one of the kids, I was 19. Yeah. So a lot of guys are gone. And it's getting smaller and smaller. And two reasons why we're going to go maybe two more years. Now, one would be, it would be the 65th anniversary, and the other, they're building a big new Marine Corps Museum outside of Quantico. I don't know if anybody knows where Quantico is, but Route 95, old, old Route 1 was the old highway, which is right, goes right through near Quantico. And to the west is 95. Well, between those two highways is where they're building this big museum. And it'll be finished, dedicated a year from now. And so we'll be there in April and hope to get up so we can go up and see that. So if there's whatever's left of us at that point. And, uh, well, it's funny, we had uh, a reunion with a group of us from upstate. And it wasn't two months afterwards, we all died. It don't take much, you know. You don't, you don't hang on or are sickly for a while. You just, you know, you get our age, you just drop dead, I guess, or something, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, so, so, any other? Um, I had one, but I forgot it. Did you read any of those things I wrote? Right here? No, the, the, that thing you gave me to fill out. Oh. I don't know if there's anything on there you want to do. Comment about it or anything? What's a battle star? What's what? A battle star? Battle star. Well, they could, for your on your ribbons. You've seen the ribbons that you know, and uh, for every major battle, they give you a star. Now we got a star for taking Tulagi, we got a star for defending Guadalcanal, we got a star for New Georgia, you know. And then when we left Guadalcanal, we ran into a sea battle. And of course, we were commanding some guns on the ship, and so we got a credit for our battle letter. So uh, what happened at the sea battle? Well, uh, it, it wasn't real. We, did, we just on the, we didn't actually get in, in, uh, engaged into it, but we ran into where it was and then we took another route and uh, they had to decide whether to go to the sea battle or, or where the submarines were. So they chose the submarines, I guess, and, and we got through. And uh, so it was one of those seven sea battles, you know, around Guadalcanal. And do check, there are more Navy casualties than there are Marines in Guadalcanal because of all the ships. Remember the story of the Sullivan brothers? Five Sullivan brothers who went down on one ship. Uh, mm -hmm. That's where it went down, along the water cut out. That was where they decided that brothers no more conserve with each other. Because you 
imagine being parents and losing five sons all at once? Boom. Um. Yeah. A lot of the stuff you already have. Or, yeah. Is this, is this the same thing you had before? Yeah. yeah. So I guess we're done. Okay. Well, thanks, Mr. Thank Anderson. Thank you. It was a wonderful interview. It's a good interview. Well, look at any of this other stuff. Okay.